The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Don Donalds, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first and foremost, obviously, in the committee room today, we have uh, family members from Highland Park and from Uvalde. Um, I'm, you know, for what you guys have had to go through, loss of your loved ones is a tragedy, obviously, for you, uh, but for all of us, because nobody wants to see these heinous acts occur. Like, everybody is truly grieved by it. I, I think that for the families who are here, and for even the families who might be watching this hearing, you might be concerned about what happens here in Congress and not understanding why the tragedy that has been you know, inflicted upon you is part of a debate or a part of a back and forth between members of Congress. And I think it's important for not just the families but for the American people to understand that when these tragedies occur, we grieve with you, but we also have the responsibility for governing the nation. We do not have the ability, we do not have the ability, although sometimes in previous Congresses that ability has been taken, but in my view, we do not have the ability to just simply pass laws because of tragedy or because of heartache. When we pass laws, the appropriate way to conduct ourselves as a legislative body is to understand what has happened in our country, but then still having to apply the Constitution still having to understand and apply the various elements of natural law and still having to apply a consistent fabric that all Americans can live under and can honor and can respect. These tragedies are crippling to see. But in and of themselves, those tragedies do not change the Second Amendment to the United States. I had a conversation in the hallway with one of the uh, the survivors of the Highland Park shooting. And in our conversation, what was mentioned was, well, what about amending the Constitution? And I would add to any one of my colleagues that if they wanted to go through the, the, the political and legislative process of amending the Constitution, that is the way we set policy and law from a governing standpoint in the United States. Um, and so I just wanted, I think it was important to it's kind of make that up because we're going up back and forth between ads and, 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 gun, and gun specifications. But for the people here in this hearing, it's important to understand why these deliberations are happening in front of you. And for the people who are watching on C-SPAN or wherever, understand why these deliberations occur. Because we just, we just can't, in my view, just pass something and just do something for the sake of doing something. Because the history of Congress is replete with Congress doing something and often doing it wrong and then ignoring that what they did wrong because you already got the ticker tape parade. Mr. Busey, quick question for you. You've, you've referred several times in, you, in your testimony today uh, that the weapons that we're talking about under a, a proposed assault weapons ban are quote unquote weapons of war. Um, and I'm paraphrasing your comments. Are these weapons, the ones that are sold, uh, the ones that are manufactured by the, by the companies here today and other companies that are not with us, are these the same weapons that are used by men and women of the United States military? With very, very minor differences, yes, they are. And in some cases, um, they are superior to the guns that we are supplying to our soldiers. Can you, di can you stipulate the differences between the guns that are used by members of our military versus what are sold uh, by retailers? That would be an awful long list, but I think what you're getting at is whether the, uh, many of the guns supplied to the military have a selective fire switch, which, which means they can fire in three-round bursts or fully auto versus semi-automatic. So what our men and women in military have are three-round bursts and fully automatic. Is that available for sale in retail in the United States of America to citizens? Not generally, no, but the, there, are many fire, there are many firearms instructors who now advocate that single fire, as in semi-auto fire, is more effective and more deadly than three-round burst or fully auto. Advocating versus what is actually allowed on a firearm, those are two different things. Wouldn't you agree, Mr. Busey? Excuse me, sir, I don't understand your you, question. If, you, if your position is that semi-automatic firing is somehow better than fully automatic or three-round bursts, those are, different, those are different distinctions. Isn't that true? 
Uh, I didn't make that designation, but there are many firearms instructors, including military firearms instructors, who now advocate for single, sh single shot as in uh, uh, semi-auto. Ms. Okafor, the weapons that are used by the United States military, are they superior in, in frankly, stopping power and ability to repel forces in a military theater than what is sold on the open market today to America? Uh, no, sir, I don't believe no, no, so. I'm talking to Ms. Sof Ms. Ms. Okafor, sorry. sorry. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, I'm a little over, but I, I thank the chair for her indulgence. The weapons that are sold um, by retailers today that are the subject of this day's hearing, are they similar in stopping power and effectiveness than what is used by members of the United States military, even though they have the same look? An M16 or M4 um, or an AR-15 are different in fact in the fact that you're able to have this, the bursts or three bur uh, round bursts or the fully automatic option that's readily available to military versus having to have a class three license that a civilian has to have and obtain in order to have a firearm with that capacity. Right. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman